Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And let me see if I can get this up. Okay, let's get rid of this. This up here. This up here. Okay, I'll leave it where it is. Um, so what I'm gonna be presenting today is some of the work that we've done uh, past, present, on uh, using the human visual system for effective visualization. And this is a topic, a theme that's run through my work from PhD uh, up until right now, actually. And so I'll give you some ideas about how we use this, uh, the kinds of things we do with it. And then if we have time at the end, I can show you a few examples of some visualization systems we built for the general public that build on top of this foundation. Okay. There we go. So from our perspective, visualization is a collaboration between the viewer and the computer. And the attempt that we're trying to uh, take advantage of here is to enhance each participant's individual strengths. So computers are very good at certain things and viewers are very good at certain things. And in particular, the human visual system has a set of capabilities that we would really like to harness. Things like uh, pattern recognition, uh, which is very difficult to actually describe to a computer algorithm, but something that humans seem to be very good at picking up on very quickly understanding domain, uh, having expertise in the domain, the ability to understand context of a situation and manage ambiguity. These are all things that we want to take advantage of when we're doing visualization. And so let the computer do the things it's good at and let the human do the things it's good at and provide some sort of mixed initiative interaction environment where they can play off one another's strengths to get something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. So let me show you some examples of some fairly famous visualizations. Uh, this is called a rose chart or a coxcomb chart, and it was actually invented by Florence Nightingale uh, during the Crimean War. So what she was trying to do was explain to the generals that unsanitary conditions in the operating rooms were causing the majority of deaths. And so she actually created this rose-like chart where each slice in the pie, if you want, is a month and the different parts of the slice represent either preventable deaths in blue, um, deaths caused by wounds in, I guess you would call it brown and black, and then the pink region is um, deaths for other reasons. And so of course her point to the generals was that you can see that the vast majority of the deaths are caused by preventable uh, reasons. So if you simply address those reasons, you could significantly decrease the mortality rate during the war. And so she has the first year on the right side and the second year on the left side as the war is winding down. And so these are very good visualizations for showing these kinds of repeating pattern type situations uh, where you have, for example, 12 months or other types of repeating patterns where you wanna compare across pattern. This is of course the very famous dot map by John Snow, his cholera map. It was the first example of visualization being used in an epidemiological setting. And so what had happened was there was a cholera outbreak in central London. And at that time, the belief was that cholera was spread as a miasma through the air. And Dr. Snow wondered if that was true. And so you can see on this map, there's a dot for every location where there's a person who has actually contracted cholera. And there are P's for places where there are public water pumps. And you also notice that larger dot right along um, Broad Street, uh, that's also a public water pump, but it seemed to be the center of the outbreak. And so there are various stories about what they did with this. They disabled the pump either by locking it or by removing the handle. And what they found was that after they did that, the disease subsided. And so their conclusion was that something in the water was actually the transmission point of the disease. And in fact, that's true for cholera. And so um, they use this dot map as a way of trying to explore and generate hypotheses into a particular problem, in this case, an epidemiological problem. This is one of our own visualizations. And if you look at it, you might think, oh, this looks somewhat painterly or um, painting-like. And that's exactly the property we're trying to instill in it. But this is actually a visualization of a slice through a simulated supernova collapse uh, being run by Dr. John Blondin here at NC State University. 
And so our particular interest here is in whether the aesthetic quality of a visualization provides any benefit over a standard uh, flow-based visualization. And so we've run numerous uh, controlled psychophysical experiments uh, with colleagues in psychology to try to get to the bottom of this question, which is um, extremely complicated. Uh, and we're, we're at a point now where we've just recently published work to show that yes, in fact, uh, if you take the extra time and effort to build one of these aesthetically pleasing visualizations, you can increase memory for detail. And memory for detail is an important property of a visualization, uh, people remembering what they saw. We've also looked a lot at how you visualize text. So initial visualizations looked at numbers, scalars, vectors, tensors. We're very good at that. Um, and then we moved on to other domains like text. So if you have a very large number of documents, uh, how can you actually provide a visual representation of those documents in a way that's going to uh, produce some sort of useful insight? One of the first techniques was tag clouds or word clouds, and you've probably seen these before. You simply count the frequency of the terms in the document or document set, and then you visualize the top the most frequent terms where their size represents some representation of their frequency. And this gives you a reasonably good summary of what the document or document collection is discussing. And so you can tell right away that this particular document is discussing something about term sentiment for uh, visualization of tweets. And in fact, it's a tag cloud of a paper we published on this particular topic. This is another example of visualizing text. This is something called phrase nets. And so what you actually do is you link terms that are uh, co-located within the document. And again, their size represents their frequency. And so you can get some idea of bigrams here. And so you can see that we're talking about things like um, text sentiment, text visualization, document similarity, recent tweets, and other things like that. And so this is a nice way to show something a little bit more than a word cloud, where you can get a little bit of extra information from these neighboring bigram terms. So let me talk a little bit about the psychophysics of vision and how we actually try to integrate that into our visualizations. So these were initially known as pre-attentive features because it was thought that their detection preceded attention. We now know that these live on a spectrum from uh, pre-attentive to attentive, uh, but pre-attentive is still used as the term to describe these because it gives a nice intuitive feel of what we're talking about. And so there are actually a fairly large number of basic visual features detected by what we would call our low-level cognitive visual system. So detection is rapid. It usually occurs in about 100 to 250 milliseconds. These are called one-glance systems because in that period of time, the visual system doesn't have enough time to choose to look somewhere else. So the only information it's getting is from wherever it's currently focused when the display is presented. You can determine things like the presence, absence, and amount of a particular feature. And it's these unique features that capture our focus of attention. And so on the top, you can see that there's a red element in a sea of blue elements. And if I actually took that display and made it bigger and increased the number of elements in the display by say an order of magnitude, the amount of time to tell me whether there was a red element or not would not change. And so these are what are called display size insensitive. So to the fidelity of the display, there's a constant amount of time required to perform the task. And you can understand why in a visualization context, we would be very interested in that. Of course, hue is not the only pre-attentive feature. So beneath that, you can see that there's a tilted element in a sea of um, horizontal elements. The color is constant. So what you're queuing in on is that tilt that orientation. And if you run experiments, what you find out is not only is this also pre-attentive, uh, display size insensitive, but it can actually be detected in a time that's as fast as the hue element. Okay. There are various theories that were proposed by this. The initial one was by Ann Treisman. It was a feature map theory that there are individual feature maps that we can access very quickly, but if we need to combine information across maps, that requires focused attention and serial scanning. And then these were revised uh, initially by uh, Jeremy Wolf to suggest that there's both bottom up and top down influence. So there's the bottom up influence, which is the pre-attentive component. And then there's the top down influence. That is, what are we actually looking for? 
and these combine in some way uh, to produce the results that we see. So here's a simple example of a hue target, uh, absent on the left, present on the right. You can see that if I increase the number of elements, it doesn't get any harder to find the actual target. Here's a curvature target, so everything is the same hue, and you notice there's a red circle on the right, but not on the left. And again, if you run experiments, you would determine that this is uh, not only pre-attentive, but as easy to detect as the hue target, although it may not seem like that in the initial uh, display. And so from a visualization point of view, what you might think is, well, this is great. So I have two visual features, hue and curvature. And so I can display two attributes. One I'll display using hue and the other I'll display using curvature. Okay. So you're still looking for a red circle here. And what you find is, oh, uh, this is a lot harder than it used to be. And what you probably resort to is serial scanning. So you'll look at a little block of elements. And if you don't see the red circle, you'll look at another block, another block, another block. And as soon as you start doing that serial scanning, obviously, if I increase the number of elements in the display, I'm going to make it uh, more time consuming for you to answer the question. Uh, whoops, my bad. And of course, there is the target. Okay. So the purpose of this demonstration is just to show you that an intuitive combination that might seem like it's going to work really well actually works very poorly. So this isn't just not taking advantage of the visual system. It's actually hooking into something that the visual system is very bad at and leveraging that. And you never want to leverage things the visual system is not good at. And so you do need to run experiments or do some kind of investigation to determine whether the intuitive conclusion is in fact going to be useful or not. Okay. Here's another thing that we can do very well, which is interesting to me because it's much more complicated. So here you're trying to identify which color has larger overall average size. If you sum up all the green circles and sum up all the blue circles, uh, which sum is bigger? And on the left, almost uniform, uh, uniformly, universally, people will say there's more green than blue. But if you ask them, why is there more green than blue? They have no idea. They just know there's more green. And I should mention that we normally uh, flash these displays up for about a quarter of a second, 250 milliseconds, but they still answer very accurately. In fact, all the green circles are just slightly bigger than all the blue circles. And so that's why you see more green than blue, but you wouldn't be able to tell us that unless you knew that uh, a priori. And on the, on the right hand side, you're gonna say there's more blue than green. And if I ask you why is that, you probably don't know why but it turns out that there's one extra big, green, uh, big blue circle in the right-hand display, okay? And so the interesting thing to me is that in uh, 100 to 250 milliseconds, we can actually do an enumeration and comparison across the display, which seems like a fairly complicated visual task, yet still our low-level visual system is capable of doing that, okay? So the guidelines that we would pull from this, if you look through all of the work that we've done is that the choice of how we map uh, data values to visual features is guided by human knowledge. We happen to know that color, which is a combination of hue, saturation, and luminance, is the most perceptually salient property. Uh, in fact, luminance is the most perceptually salient property, which is not surprising because it's used for things like edge detection and uh, motion detection. Texture is also available, so size, orientation, density, regularity, placement, and you can use motion itself, flicker, phase, direction, and that will be very uh, easy for a person to detect. There are also hierarchies that control the order data feature mapping. So it turns out that, for example, luminance dominates hue and color dominates texture, and regularity is perceptually weak. So based on that, we can actually define an order of importance of data attribute and how visual features should be assigned based on that importance ordering. So another interesting question, and this was also by Jeremy Wolf, uh, was something called post-attentive amnesia. And so the question here was, if you allow a viewer to preview a scene, are they gonna be faster answering questions about that scene than if you just ask a question and show them the scene? So intuition suggests, yeah, if you let me look at a scene as long as I want to, um, I should be faster at answering questions about it when you ask them to me. Right? But various experiments have shown, nope, that's not how the human visual system works. Uh, although people often think of it this way, vision is not a camera that takes a snapshot 
and then builds up those snapshots into a full detail representation of the scene. Normally, you only have uh, high detail in the area that you happen to be focusing on at any given period of time. And when you move your focus of attention somewhere else, you lose that high detail. Uh, it's replaced or something happens, we don't know for sure, uh, by where you look next. Now, obviously, context, uh, being able to hook into long-term memory and other things like that will affect this. So we're talking about abstract scenes, uh, not scenes where you can actually use uh, memory uh, for past scenes to get information. So if you look on the right, you would see one of these abstract scenes. This is called a priming image. But we can actually try this. So you see here I asked for a purple oblique. And uh, there it is down in the left-hand corner. There's a purple tilted rectangle. Okay. So first, we'll do no priming. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to ask you to look for a green vertical and then show you the scene. And you'll recognize, yeah, it's there. It's down in the bottom middle. And the strategy most people use for this is that they tend to scan either clockwise or counterclockwise until they either find the target or they don't find it and report, no, that target is not in the scene. Okay. So I'll prime you with this one. So here you go. Spend as much time as you want looking at it. Commit this to memory. All right. And when you're ready, I can ask you for a white oblique. And what you'll realize is that there is no white oblique. And to be honest, for most of you, you'll probably have resorted to the same strategy of scanning. And the reason why is that you can't commit to memory all the elements in the scene because they're abstract. And so if you're lucky and you happen to be looking right where the target appears, you'll be very quick to answer that. Otherwise, you have to look through. Um, you actually aren't able to memorize all the different elements in the display. And so that has obvious consequences for visualization. So we can't expect that if we just let you look at a visualization in some abstract form for a longer period of time that you'll have a better memory for recall. And so you remember that that ties directly back into our investigation of aesthetic visualizations and trying to determine whether that increases memory for detail or not. Okay. And the fact of the matter is you already know this. Um, you might not have known that it's called change blindness, but you definitely knew this phenomenon exists because you've seen it before. So the visual system has a limited memory for detail, uh, often restricted to our focus of attention. Um, and if you think about short-term memory and memory bandwidth, that's probably not surprising. So a visual disruption in ISACOD can render us blind to changes in the scene. So if you look away and look back again, uh, if something's changed in the scene, you may not see it because the visual system assumes uh, consistency in the absence of any evidence that that's not true. So an example would be find the difference between two images. And so if you look at the right image and you look at the left image, if you could actually snapshot an image, you would just snapshot one of the two, look at the other one, and then compare it to the snapshot to determine where the differences are. But what you find is that that's not possible. So you start looking back and forth at different locations in the image, same location in the two images to see are those the same or not. And since you're focusing your attention on the same location, then you are able to actually do that comparison. And so this original research on this was conducted by one of my colleagues at Nissan's Cambridge Basic Research Center. It's Nissan Car Company's uh, Research Center in, in Massachusetts. And what they were trying to study was why do accidents occur? automobile accidents in situations where there's obvious visual evidence that an accident will occur and there's more than enough time to actually avoid the accident. So uh, the example they would use is that you're driving through a parking lot and somebody backs out and you run into them, even though you had plenty of time to stop. And so when police ask people, so what happened there? Uh, people will reply, I was completely blind uh, to that or what they'll actually reply is, I never saw that car there. And so the initial belief was that people were either lying or they were stupid. But if you think about change blindness, you recognize that if you look out and there's no car there and you look away and you look back, but not where the car's backed out, you may in fact be completely blind to it. And I'm sorry to report this happened to me about six months ago. I was driving into my, actually into my cul-de-sac and so I looked out and there was no one there and I looked away and uh, I looked back and someone had pulled out and started driving down the road 
and I didn't see them. In fact, I didn't even realize there was someone there until I'd run into them and tried to figure out what just happened to me. So, um, so knowing it didn't make me feel any better. Uh, and I don't think that the person I hit would have taken that as an excuse. Look, I'm, I'm a professional. This was changed blindness. So you can't really blame me for that. Yeah, no. There you go. Find five differences. I like the Smurfs. So give you a few seconds to take a look. And so there they are. And the interesting thing is you might find that some of these are easier and some of them are harder. And we're still trying to figure out why is that? Uh, I find, and I think most people find that recognizing that the stripes on the B are reversed is usually the hardest thing to find. Uh, detecting that the flower is gone is pretty easy. I uh, direction is easy as well. Um, but let me show you some examples of that. And I'm gonna warn people before I show these. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a scene, uh, two examples of a scene, and something very significant is gonna be different between the two scenes. And they're gonna flash up for about 100 milliseconds. Then I'll put a gray mask in between them uh, to basically uh, wipe your visual memory, uh, your um, visual retina, and then I'll put the other scene up. If this is gonna be an issue for you, so people who have epilepsy, for example, would not wanna look at this. Um, you should probably not view these. Um, so having said that, uh, take a look at these two images and see if you can recognize what the difference is between them. Now, I know what the difference is, so I can't not see it. Uh, but for people who are unique to this, um, what you tend to do is you tend to start looking around, trying to figure out where's the difference. So you look at a location in the scene for a couple of flips and if you don't see it you'll look somewhere else you'll look somewhere else and once you find it you realize oh that isn't a subtle difference and you'll probably wonder like how did I miss that well that's change blindness and so if you're wondering where's the difference here take a look at the jet engine on the wing of the airplane and you'll notice that it's present absent present absent present absent okay so the complete removal of an object so you might think well maybe I just you know, uh, shiny on there. Maybe this doesn't happen very often. So we can try another scene. No social distancing here, very bad. But anyway, um, if you're wondering what's the difference here, if you haven't already seen it, uh, take a look at the pants on the gentleman to the very left. So he's switching between jeans and khakis. Okay, so that's a color difference as opposed to a uh, addition and removal of an item. Okay, and so it's interesting that I don't show these, and I probably should, but uh, there are an equally uh, interesting set of images where you can see the difference immediately, and we don't really understand what the difference is between the ones that are easy and the ones that are hard. And so there's been a lot of work on trying to build a model of change blindness to explain it. So the initial and easiest explanation is that it's overwriting. The current image is being overwritten by the new one. And so unless you uh, focus in on a common location for a few flips, you're not actually gonna see the change. Uh, but we've shown examples where that's not true because we have easy and hard situations. There's also uh, a theory that says it's a first impression so the initial view is abstracted, and unless you notice that there's a change, you actually won't think that there has been one, you won't report it. The way they tested this, interestingly, is they showed people uh, a little movie. And so you can see some clips from that movie to the right. So there's a graduate student sitting in his office, the telephone rings, so he walks out the door, and you can see him walk out into the hallway and answer the phone. And so what they do is they ask people after they've seen this short clip, is there anything odd about that uh, clip? And about 75 to 80% of the people will say, no, uh, it seemed fine. There was nothing odd about it. And then they'll ask the person, okay, can you describe the graduate student? And they always describe him as the student sitting at the desk. So their first impression of the student. But if you actually look at this, you recognize that, um, look at the top left and the bottom right. Glasses are different, hairstyle is different, shirt is open versus closed. It's a completely different, uh, representation of the person. But the majority of people don't recognize that. 
because they don't see anything during that uh, scene change, which simulates a saccade, they're missing the fact that something significant has changed about the person, okay? Obviously, if we went from male to female, that kind of abstraction people would recognize right away. And so it's properties of the person that they're missing. Another um, theory is that nothing is stored. So the actual world, the scene itself is our memory store. And so if you wanna know something about the scene, you just look back into it at the location where you wanna know information and you pull it out. So you're actually not remembering any details about the scene. Um, another is feature combination. So somehow old and new scenes are being combined in some way. And we don't know which parts are from the old scene and which parts are from the new scene, uh, unless there's some kind of contradiction that occurs and that would trigger us to the fact that there's a difference in the two scenes, okay? And then the last theory, and I always tell people this is the one that concerns me the most, is that everything is actually stored, but nothing is compared. And what this means is that the details cannot be accessed without some external stimulus, but once you get that stimulus, you have the detail. The way this experiment runs is that you're walking down the street and someone stops you and asks you for directions. And so you're a nice person, so you start giving them directions. And while this is happening, uh, some workers come with a door and they apologize, but they have to walk between you and the person you're giving directions to in order to get this door through. Now, it turns out that the person that you're giving directions to is holding a basketball. And the basketball is fairly unique in terms of its colors. I think it's normally red, white, and blue. And so as the door is uh, sort of obscuring your view of the person, they're moving it through, there's somebody standing behind the door and they would walk through and take the basketball. So after the door's gone through, the person you're talking to no longer has the basketball. And you finish giving directions and then they tell you that they're running an experiment. And you're asked, so did anything change about the person you were talking to when that door went through? And again, about 75 to 80% of the people will say, nope. I didn't see any difference, it was exactly the same. But if you then ask them, really, were they holding anything? Every one of those people who didn't recognize the change will say, yeah, you know, you're right, they were holding a basketball and they can uh, describe the basketball in great detail. So they actually have detail of memory of the basketball, they just don't have access to it until you ask them in the right way. And the reason I don't like this is that I don't like the fact that there are things in my head that only you can get at, so. None of these series, by the way, is uh, complete. So there are uh, contradictions that have been uh, shown to every one of the theories. So we're still thinking about uh, what exactly is change blindness and how does it work. All right, so uh, let me talk to you about a few uh, examples of how we're trying to apply this information in our visualization context. And so this is a project that I've been working on with people in public policy and with the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture who are jointly responsible for wildfire incidents. And so we're trying to figure out are there ways to help people during a wildfire incident. Um, this is actually a wildfire that occurred in a place called Kelowna in Canada, British Columbia back in 2003. And the reason I show you this particular image is that the location where the image is being taken from is where my parents live. And so they have wildfire incidents like this two to three times a year. Um, they're, of course, incredibly destructive. And they're also, um, uh, they tend to give you some anxiety, even if you've been around them a lot. And so two years ago, my parents went on to, um, there's various levels of notice. You can go on to, um, you know, potential evacuation notice. So that's the lowest level of notice. Then you can go on to one hour notice. What that means is that you'll be told you have an hour to leave. And then you can go on to what's known as immediate notice. And immediate notice means that a firefighter will bang on your door at some time of the day or night and say, go now, and you have to immediately leave. And so your car has to be packed, you just get in and drive. And so uh, my parents were on immediate notice twice uh, a couple of years ago, yeah. So I think they're gonna move actually because um, things are only getting worse and the resources have been uh, exhausted at this point. So the firefighters have to make decisions about which fires are we actually going to focus on because there are always too many to focus on all of them uh, at the same time. So. so in the United States, there is a national cohesive strategy and this is what it is, to safely and effectively extinguish fire when needed, uh, use fire where allowable and manage our natural resources and as a nation live with wildland fire. 
So an admission that there is always going to be fire. Sometimes we need to put it out and sometimes we should just let it burn. Okay. So if you're curious about fires, um, this is the National Interagency Fire Center. And these are the 25 largest fires by acreage over the last, mm, well, it starts in 1815. So maybe getting close to 200 years, okay, give or take. And so some of these back in the early 1800s were estimates. So I think that the um, Mary Matchy fire, for example, was reported by Lewis and Clark. And so they estimated that it had about 300, uh, about 3 million acres on fire. But now the ones that you're talking about in the 2000s, and you can see there's quite a few of them, uh, these are very carefully measured. And you might notice that in 1815 through 1997, the rate of large fires that hit the top 25 was, you know, um, fairly infrequent. But over the last 20 years, we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of the largest 25 fires. So clearly we're getting more fires and they're bigger. Okay, and you probably recognize some of these like the um, uh, Long Draw Fire, the Rim Fire, um, and this is only out to 2013. There's been some more fires that have hit the largest 25 in the uh, seven years that I'm not including here. And this is an a example of um, how many fires there have been for a given year and how many acres they've burned. And so you don't see a real pattern here. Um, there's been some big fires uh, or large numbers of fires back in the 80s and acreage burn. But then when you switch over to, well, how much is it costing us to fight these fires? You see an obvious pattern, all right? It's costing a lot more money now than it did in the past to fight these fires. And you can see it split through the US Forest Service, which is in the Department of Agriculture and then the Department of the Interior because they're both responsible for this, okay? And so it would be useful to actually deal with this situation in a way that would help us get some management over what it's costing to fight these fires. And so the objectives of the project we're working on here are trying to determine um, what are the risk narratives that are communicated through social media when fires are either happening or when we're trying to tell people how to deal with fires, okay? And so narrative is a natural language construct that we actually work with. Um, so how are these narratives shaped by ecological, social, political characteristics? And the people I'm working with, there are two things they're curi uh, curious about trying to uh, perform. One is community engagement. So people are building in locations where we know they shouldn't build. So a good example would be steep, um, steep valley, uh, uh, steep valleys out in Colorado and you tell people um, there's definitely going to be a fire here it's just a matter of when and if you're on a steep valley slope uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because that fire is going to run down that valley slope faster than you can say what, what the heck um, but people still build there and they build very nice uh, multi-million dollar houses and so the first thing fire officials are curious about is if you do that can we communicate some risk mitigated, mitigation strategies to you via social media a channel like Twitter? So things that are easy to do but might help your house survive. And then during a wildfire event, can Joint Fire Science, can JFS monitor and communicate with the community through a social media platform like Twitter? Nowadays, because of 24-hour news and other things, people expect to be uh, communicated with probably on the hour and they'll have particular things that they're most interested in. Some are easy to guess, like is my house gonna burn down? Um, what's the current situation of the fire? But others are more subtle. So for example, one of the things that's often very important to people is which roads are open and which are closed? Because I'm gonna be driving through this area and I need to know how to get through. I don't actually live here, but I need to get through here, okay? And so the idea is that in both situations, you would tweet something out with a particular hashtag, and then Joint Fire Science could pick it up and use our visualization analytics tools to try to determine what do we want to actually talk about when we go out and speak to the community. So if you wonder about mitigation strategies, this is from Colorado Springs, um, and there are 10 things you can do to mitigate uh, wildfire risk, and they're all very simple things. So things like making sure there aren't trees hanging over your house. All right, there are certain kinds of plants that you can plant that are resistant to fire and so they act as a natural fire break. 
um, you probably want a tile roof. Cedar shake roof is probably not a good idea, right? Uh, and other things like that, okay? So the idea for us would be to capture index and store wildfire incident tweet communication and then perform thematic and sentiment analysis of those, analyze and visualize that information flow, and then provide it to joint fire science as a tool that they can use for engagement and communication. And in fact, we've been capturing tweets for four or five years now, I think, uh, continuously. And so we have, I think at this point, tens of millions of tweets that discuss wildfire. And so they look like this. Um, so we're looking at the keywords wildfire and forest service, and then we're using um, machine learning algorithms to actually weed out tweets that aren't actually talking about wildfire events. So they're talking about the HTC wildfire phone, or they're talking about something spreading like wildfire. Uh, we have ways to remove those. And so the relevant information we get from each tweet is things like who tweeted, if they provided, what the geolocation of the tweet was, uh, what the body of the tweet was, and when it was tweeted. Okay. And then we actually have a way to take the body of the tweet and estimate if the sentiment of the person who's actually posting the tweet. So sentiment is an attitude, thought, or judgment prompted by feeling. Um, there are a variety of natural language processing approaches like subjectivity, classification, machine learning, uh, semantic orientation to try to identify the sentiment of a tweet. We actually use a simpler technique called sentiment dictionaries. And so what these do uh, are very similar to normal dictionaries. You look up a word, but rather than getting its definition, you actually get a set of uh, metrics on the particular word, sentiment metrics, um, to tell you something about how that term is uh, judged in terms of emotion or sentiment. The simplest dictionaries, and by far the vast majority of dictionaries, give you simply a pleasure rating. It's pleasant, it's unpleasant, or it's neutral, usually a three uh, three term scale. More sophisticated dictionaries like the ones that we're building and using uh, will actually give you semi-continuous representations over a set of more than one, after, uh, more than one axis. Um, and that's useful because it allows you more granularity. Okay, so here are, are a couple of models. These all come from the psychological community. Uh, the top one is a very common one called Russell's emotional circumplex. So you can see that he has two axes, a pleasure axis and what's called an activation axis. And so they are considered to be psychologically orthogonal. And so you can walk these axes or you can look at combinations of them to try to get uh, co combined terms. Uh, the one below is Pluchek's emotional wheel. Uh, it has more axes uh, and it also r rises up on a third dimension of dominance, okay? And there are other um, models that are quite similar as well. And so we happen to pick Russell's model because a lot of the dictionaries that are built are using that model uh, to choose their particular attributes that they're gonna attach to each term. Okay. And so we have a visualizer that can actually uh, allow you to query recent tweets for keywords that you choose. Uh, the Twitter API supports that. And then we actually identify tweets with at least two terms that we recognize, and we use those two or more terms to estimate the sentiment of each tweet. And then we visualize those on an emotional scatter plot. So this is the emotional scatter plot that we use, and you can recognize, well, this is Russell's emotional circumplex. So we have pleasure on the horizontal axis, we have activation on the vertical axis. We actually have a semi-continuous scale of nine ratings, so uh, nine, uh, points along each of those. And the reason it matters to have multiple axes is for the following reason. So suppose I'm really pleased and I'm really active, okay? So I would be in the range of the scatter plot where I would be excited or elated or alert, all right? Well, suppose I was equally pleased, but I was very low on the activation scale as opposed to very high. Now I would be relaxed or calm or serene. And so what you can see is that if you only look at pleasure, you can't differentiate between being excited and being relaxed. You need that second axis to do that. And that's why we include it. We actually have a third axis called dominance, which we're not using, um, but is available to us if we ever decided we wanted it. Okay. And so we represent each tweet as a circle. Its hue tells you its valence or its pleasure. Valence is just a technical term that they use for pleasure. So uh, blue tweets are unpleasant, green tweets are pleasant. 
Arousal is uh, presented through luminance. So the brighter you are, the more active or aroused you are. And then we have two measures of confidence, size and opacity. So the bigger something is, the more confident we are in our estimate and the more solid the color is, the less transparent it is, the more confident we are in its estimate. And those are done along two different uh, confidence measures. It's always important in a visualization, if you can, to convey some sense of confidence because people are making decisions based on the data that they see. And if one data point is highly confident and another data point is highly um, lacking in confidence, it's a guess, you don't want people weighting those two points the same when they make their decision, okay? And there's always uncertainty in every visualization. And so if you can capture that, it's useful. So you'll get something like this. Um, this is from the El Dorado uh, fire in 2014, the King fire. Um, and so what we're looking at is tweets over a certain span of time, and you can see that they're trending negative in pleasure, which is not surprising. And they're also trending to be aroused above the um, cut point for arousal, which is also not surprising. Okay. And uh, if I have time to demo the application, I can show you that you can hover over a tweet um, to actually get more information about it. So the little bubble there is hovering over the tweet. Uh, the words that are actually highlighted in bold italics are the words that we have in our dictionary and the words that we're using to actually estimate the sentiment of the tweet. And then if you actually look in the um, dialogue, we've clicked on a different tweet. And so now it's showing you the exact valence and arousal that we've estimated. It's showing you the terms that we used and it's showing you what their individual valences and arousals are, um, both in terms of average and standard deviation and then how many people rated that term. So how many people are we using for that rating uh, in terms of frequency? Okay, we have other tabs on the visualization tool as well. So this is an affinity graph. It's showing you co-occurrence of terms or other types of properties within a tweet. And so the blue greens are tweets, uh, pleasing or unpleasing. And then red is uh, URLs. Um, yellow circles are actually hashtags and orange circles are entities. So if you're responding to someone retweeting like um, with an at symbol, that would be in there. Or if you're actually the person who's authoring the tweet, that would be in there as well. So you can see forestry and wildfire. Um, what is that? Emergency newswire. Uh, those are two entities that were um, fairly highly frequent in this particular set of affinity information. So text visualizations matured is something we started looking at 15 years ago. At this point, I, I would call it a fairly solved problem, um, except for some particular domains that have unique properties to them, okay? Uh, sentiment analysis continues as an active area of research. And so there are many approaches depending on the type of text you're looking at. And if you wonder, well, what are we not good at? Well, we're not good at things like sarcasm, all right? If you put in a sarcastic tweet, our system will almost certainly get it exactly wrong, backwards, because we can't tell that it's sarcastic. Uh, subject identification, what are you talking about? Context, we're not good at. And interestingly, negation is still an unsolved problem. Um, perfect negation, we don't know how to do. Although we do have negation integrated into our current tool and it seems to work fairly well. And so text analytics coupled with visualization can provide things like environmental risk management and tracking. We've also used it for political trend analysis. We worked with a local um, NBC Fox affiliate here in Raleigh uh, to do real time uh, analysis of tweets as the political uh, debates were going on for the presidential campaign. So you could watch on WRAL the presidential debate and you could keep your computer up in about 15 to 30 seconds after someone said something during the debate, you could watch the tweets roll in and see what people's um, sentiment was about the particular comments that a uh, particular candidate had made, which was sort of fun actually. So. so I'll just finish up with something on coronavirus. And this is something Susan and I have been working on. So we've actually built a general public dashboard for tracking coronavirus, COVID-19. So our particular interest was in focusing on findings that aren't commonly available. So if you go out now, you can easily find maps uh, showing you how many cases have occurred in different geographic locations. You can easily find graphs that show you what's the sequence of 
cases over time. And so we do provide those because I think they provide important context, but we also wanted to provide some things that you couldn't commonly find. And so we started with two things. The first is a region region case progression similarity. So what a user can do is they can choose a target region. So that would be the United States, New York State, Italy, whatever you want. And then what we do is we actually compare the sequence of either fatalities or the sequence of confirmed cases to all other regions that are reporting data. There's about 180 of them. And then we order those regions based on their curves similarity to your target regions curves similarity. So you can see which regions are similar to me in terms of their fatality sequence or their confirmed case sequence. And we use uh, dynamic time warping to actually de define this particular similarity. And we visualize it as a similarity graph from most similar to least similar. The second thing we were curious about is something uh, related to case progression inflection points. So there's all this talk about bending the curve. And so we actually wanted to try to determine based on what we've seen to date, when do we think your curve will bend or has it bent already? And so we used four parameter logistic regression to fit a sigmoid function to the case curve. Obviously the back end of the sigmoid function won't fit properly because we expect things to hit a peak and then decrease. Whereas the sigmoid curve will expect things to simply stay constant past the peak. But that's actually not affecting the um, accuracy or lack thereof, I suppose, of the technique to identify the inflection point. And it's a little more complicated than that because we have many, many, many points and uh, this particular uh, 4PL technique is very sensitive to the points you give it. So we walk the curve, uh, we generate an estimate of the inflection point um, and some property like how many cases occurred or what's the steepness of the curve at the inflection point. And then we run clustering on all of those um, estimates to find common estimates uh, and we visualize that as a scatter plot of common estimates for bend date and confidence in our estimate. Okay, and so here's an example of the US being compared to other regions. And so you can see uh, fatality curves on the top, confirmed case curves on the bottom. And so the US is most similar, at least uh, on April 23rd when I took this, which I think was yesterday. Uh, to Italy, Spain, France, New York State, and then the UK. And in terms of confirmed cases, it was most similar to New York State, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. Okay. And you have um, drop-down menus on the right so you can change which country you're interested in. Okay. And this would be an example of curve bend and maximum cases at the bend. And so each one of these circles represents one of the estimates. And if it's tagged with a number behind it, like uh, Montenegro 2 or Wyoming 1, that just means that we had more than one cluster when we clustered, and so this is one of the estimates. And the circle size tells you how confident we are in the estimate. The bigger the circle, the less confidence we have. Uh, so you see, at least we believe we're pretty confident about Wyoming 1, um, but we really have no idea about Montenegro 2. And so maybe I can demonstrate some of these. Let me see if I can uh, get out of here, get my web browser up. So I'll start with the Twitter visualizer. Um, you can just call out, a, uh, if anyone's curious about a keyword, um, just tell me. Unmute yourself and go ahead. Or I'm gonna call on Susan to do it. I'm not allowed to choose words, by the way, um, due to my inappropriate nature. And I'll also warn you that none of this is filtered, so you're probably gonna see some bad words, um, but you can't do anything about that about COVID? What about COVID? I knew you were going to say that. Whoops, I spelt it wrong. Oh, well. There are some COVID words. So it's uh, querying Twitter right now. Let me put in COVID. I'm sort of curious what OVID was, but okay. So it got 377 tweets that it could estimate sentiment on, and you can see them on the scatter plot. And people always go for the outliers. So if we hover over this one, we see that it's got the words quarantine and snitch. And those, if we click on that, 
have a very low pleasure and a somewhat elevated arousal. And so that's why that came out the way it did. If we look at this one, what, what are you happy about? Um, so it's health, people, and positive. And so you can see that this is probably misclassified. Um, all right, because it's talking about cases in Kenya. But because we only recognize those particular terms and in isolation, they tend to be high on the pleasure scale. Uh, we classified this tweet as being pleasing. Hmm. So a uh, quote from the president. We have other uh, tabs here. So the topic tab will try to determine whether there are topic clusters within the tweets. In this case, there were not. Heat map is just a more granular, uh, less granular uh, visualization of where in the four regions of sentiment you're seeing your tweet. So upper left would be um, unpleasant or unhappy. Upper right would be happy. Lower right would be uh, content. And lower left would be sad. Okay. And you can see most of them are happening, interestingly, uh, on the happy side of the graph, the pleasing side. Tag cloud just shows you which terms are most frequent uh, in those four regions. And again, blue-green tells you whether it's unpleasant or pleasant. That's actually why we have this. You wouldn't need it if you just had the sentiment plot because you know left and right is blue and green. And then if you have a term that we don't have in our dictionary, it comes out as gray. Okay. There's a timeline of tweets. So you can see, interestingly, that uh, we run from 1252.15 to 1252.32. What that means is that Twitter only had to go back 15 seconds to find enough tweets to give back to us. And that's pretty quick. Um, it'll go back as far as a week. Okay. And so most um, terms don't come back this quickly. And so what that means is that COVID is a very popular term on Twitter right now. All right. Um, we have nothing on the map and that's because geolocation for Twitter is opt-in and nobody who posted had opted to provide their geolocation about 1% of people do, and so you normally don't see a lot there. This is the affinity graph, and so there are lots of frequent terms, but no co-occurrences. And so if you hover over it, it'll tell me how many there are, and you can drag it around. And it'll sort of, you know. Narrative is an attempt to find narrative threads within the tweets. And so often in Twitter, people are not talking directly to one another, but they're talking about the same thing and those actually form threads. I don't see any interesting threads here, but sometimes you'll get threads that are quite long and they'll split and reform as the uh, particular topic or narrative that people are discussing very slightly. And then we have the tweets themselves. And so you can go through them. You can search on them if you want to. Um, so if you wanted to search on a particular country. So these are tweets that have New York in them. Okay. And you can see these orange terms. These are terms that we've estimated where we think they've been negated. So don't think, couldn't go. Um, and so we have a completely different score if you're negated versus if you're not negated. Okay. And we also do emoticons. So I don't know if these emoticons, yeah, these emoticons did not show up. But sometimes they do. This one did. I can see this one is italicized. And so there is its valence and arousal. So that's the tweet visualizer. I can quickly show you the COVID uh, visualizer. Oops, my bad. So this is the region region comparison for the US uh, today. And so um, it's stabilized over the last week or so. And so you don't see a lot of change in the graph and you don't see a lot of change in the order of the countries. Um, this changes quite a bit um, when we expect certain countries to bend their curve and what we expect either the maximum count for fatalities and confirmed cases to be, or what we expect the steepness of the curve to be um, for fatalities and confirmed cases. We also have a country totals. So this would be in just an informative visualization. And we provide both the absolute and the logarithmic values because uh, certain countries have such high numbers that they completely overwhelm everything else. So you really can't see any differences here. But in the logarithmic curve, you can get that difference. 
Um, these are country prog progression curves. So if you just want to know what's happened over time, that's what this is showing you. So as of uh, usually these results are reported in the evening. So as of this morning at around 5 a.m., there were almost 50,000 confirmed cases of fatality and about 870,000 cases of actual disease infection in the U.S. And then a map. Okay. And in this map, uh, what we do is anything below the median value is blue, Every, anything above the median value is red, and the saturation tells you how close you are to the endpoints. So, and you should feel free to go and play around with these anytime you want. Uh, I update them every morning when I come into work. So. All right, so that's what I have to say about that. Uh, I hope it was informative, uh, or at least somewhat entertaining. And so if you're curious about any of these particular projects, uh, the Fire Chasers project is available at this research site for uh, College of Natural Resources. And then we have Go Links for our visualizer and our COVID visualization. And they're available anytime. The only thing I'll mention about the tweet visualizer is that Twitter does rate limit us every 15 minutes to a maximum number of queries. So you may go in there and if it's uh, getting a lot of queries at a particular time, it'll tell you that um, it's uh, rate limited. Although I've noticed, it, noticed that even when you're rate limited, you normally get back a little bit of data. And so we do visualize that for you. Um, but we warn you that you're probably not getting as much as you could because you're rate limited. So. All right, so that is that. Uh, I have seen stuff coming up in the chat side. So let me go over here and I'll just see what's going on. Okay, so I'll just go through these um, in order and uh, try to answer them. Are these observations true for people with photographic memory? Um, that's a good question, and that's something that we actually don't know. Uh, I don't think we've actually run any experiments where we take people with photographic memory uh, versus people without. Photographic memory means different things for different people. So for a lot of people, photographic memory is their ability to recall uh, some written text that they've seen. Um, I don't know that I've actually ever talked to anyone who has photographic memory for abstract image. And so it would be an interesting question. Um, so I would say I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I think it's a good question to ask. And so can people improve their ability to perceive, uh, be trained to see? Yes, people can get better at these experiments. And so when we run them, what we tend to do is we run you through a set of practices that are actually getting you to some baseline. Uh, and then we actually analyze the data only after that point, although we don't tell you that. Um, and we look at relative difference. So different people are better or worse than one another at doing these, but their relative ability tends to be very constant. And so we run almost entirely um, within subject experiments. Um, and we are just looking for you as an individual, what is your relative performance and how does that relative performance compare to other individuals' relative performances? So, uh, Susan asks, are dollars adjusted for inflation? Uh, you, I don't actually know the answer to that, but I believe it is yes. I wanted to say yes. Uh, the site that I took it from did the actual data collection and I believe they said that they did adjust for inflation. Okay. Uh, we have 100 year flood regions. Why not 100 year fire regions? Uh, that's a good question and I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure joint fire science knows that. Um, they're actually uh, dealing with a lot of overwhelming information at this point because um, as you know, wildfires have gotten completely out of control over the last few years and they have no ability to actually fight all of the fires that are going on at any given time. Uh, and so they're just trying to patchwork together uh, what they can do. And so you would have uh, once in a hundred year fire and that's happening every year now. And so um, I don't know at the higher levels of the administration how they plan to deal with this, um, but they're certainly struggling uh, to get a handle on it. Is there age bias in tweets? Um, that's an interesting question. And one that came up when we did our um, work with WRAL. So their initial concern was that uh, well, it went along the following, and you can decide whether you believe these stereotypes or not, but they said Republicans tend to be older than Democrats, 
So we're worried that when you actually do this visualization, you'll be overwhelmed by democratic tweets because, um, or tweets about, uh, in our case, one case we were doing Romney Obama. You'll be overwhelmed with tweets uh, about uh, President Obama and you won't have very many about uh, candidate Romney because only young people will be tweeting. And that turned out to be completely not true. In fact, it was interesting if we just measured uh, the number of tweets about the two candidates outside of a presidential debate, Obama tweets outnumbered Romney tweets three to one, but during the debate and only during the debate, Romney tweets outnumbered Obama tweets three to one. So the idea that uh, people who are engaged uh, but older won't tweet uh, turned out to be completely untrue. Um, they tweet and uh, they tweet exactly what they think. <laughs> There's no worry there. Um, and if you actually look at the statistics that uh, Twitter puts out about um, demographics, uh, the distribution of people across age range tends to be fairly close to the distribution of age range across, um, for example, the United States, uh, where you see some mismatch in distribution is actually along ethnicity. Um, so it turns out that certain ethnic groups tend to tweet more than their relative percentage in the population. Um, but we don't see very many uh, significant di distribution uh, variations in terms of, say, gender, age, uh, or other properties like that. Uh, properties that um, people are actually, uh, Twitter's actually providing to us. So. Um, tweet bombing? Yeah, that happens all the time. Uh, and you saw that in the um, most recent elections. So in essence, they're doing exactly on Twitter what they're doing on Facebook, which is that they're creating fake narrative. And they're definitely pushing that hard uh, in different ways to try to get the attention of the people that they're trying to attract uh, to convince them of something that they want to convince them of. And uh, in addition to tweet bombing uh, or uh, tweeting out these kinds of things, what concerns me is um, people who I know are incredibly intelligent and rational and their inability to actually apply any of that to a tweet they receive. So my, my aunt who actually uh, runs her own real estate agency, so she's a very successful business person, uh, told me one day, um, uh, so you know Obama's a Muslim, right? And I said, oh, I said, I didn't know that. He's self-identifying as a Christian. She said, nope, he's a Muslim. And I said, um, huh, that's interesting. Why do you think that? And she said, oh, uh, I got a tweet that told me that. And I said, and you think that's authoritative? And she said, well, I think it's true. And I was like, huh, how did that happen? I don't know, but it scared me. <laughs> so uh, Dave says, are artists that better at visualiz visualization recall or detail? Uh, interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you something interesting about the experiments that we ran. So we built our initial um, painterly visualizations and we actually tested them on two groups of people. Uh, people who were just um, artistically naive and people who had actually taken a course on art theory and art history. And so the people who are artistically naive uh, gave us some very consistent ratings on the artistic aesthetic of the different visualizations we had. The people who were artistically knowledgeable looked at our visualizations and said, all of these are crap. All you've done is laid down some uh, simulated paint strokes on the screen. That's not art. And um, we were like, huh, that's interesting. So we went back and looked harder at well, what is it that actually uh, influences this aesthetic in an artistic painting? And so it turns out that it's a notion of psychological complexity. And so when we built our next set of visualizations, we actually tried to vary psychological complexity within the visualizations, as opposed to simply varying uh, visual complexity. And when we did that, we got uh, consistent uh, aesthetic ratings for the different kinds of paintings that we were producing from both the naive and from the um, knowledgeable uh, participants. In fact, the knowledgeable participants mentioned, oh, uh, it looks like you've actually taken a look at this and learned something. These are quite a bit better than the ones you showed us before. So that was nice.
So, yeah. Are they better at recall or decal? Um, that's a good question. And uh, we haven't tested that. Um, what we have seen is that for the people we have tested, those who are both artistically inclined and those who are not, um, their recall for detail was uh, the same. So maybe that suggests that they aren't better at recall for detail. Um, but there was certainly an interesting preference uh, for the kinds of visualizations they saw uh, and the general comment I would make, which is a complete generalization, I think, is that people who don't look at a lot of art really like realistic art, so impressionism, and they really don't understand abstract art, so uh, Clay, Klee, or uh, Mondrain, or um, Pollock, okay? But the people who have had an experience with art uh, appreciate both, and they have a preference for both. It doesn't mean that they like abstract more than realistic, uh, realism. It just means that they actually have the ability to compare the two and they don't need jerk to say that they don't understand abstract art. And I found this exactly to be true for myself. Uh, when I started, I loved impressionism. I didn't get abstractionism. And so my supervisor, psychological uh, psychology supervisor, picked the abstract art that we used. Um, but the more time I spent actually being surrounded by it, the more appreciation I gained for it. And now if you go to my office, I have a combination of both. Uh, and I definitely have a preference for what kind of abstract art I like and what I don't like. And so maybe it was just a question of experience or exposure uh, to get me to that point. Okay. Uh, so someone says, did I understand that you use larger circles for larger variance, uh, but doesn't larger size draw more attention to these points? Um, not necessarily. Uh, so size is pre-attentive. And so what that means is that you can identify for a certain difference in size, that there is a difference in size. It could be that contextually, you feel like larger means more. And the reason we chose larger circles was because we wanted to impart more uncertainty. But if people are making the assumption that larger means more confident, then we've got a problem. And we would have to look into that and try to figure out uh, whether that was true or not. So, yeah. And then uh, another question that says, I think it would be interesting to test artists uh, and photographic memory folks since this might give insight into the portions of vision that are hardwired versus learned. Uh, I agree with that. Um, we certainly still don't know much about, uh, we know a lot about the visual system, but we certainly don't know everything. And we're always finding new and fascinating things that we then start trying to explain. And so this could be one of the things that we look at and find differences that are really interesting and also may, maybe insightful into some of the other things that we're looking at and trying to figure out. Um, so I'm gonna pass this suggestion down to the people that I know that work on this uh, and see if we can find enough photographic memory people to actually run this kind of experiment, so. Um, any other questions I can answer for people? I think we're a little over time here, so. Um, let me just thank you uh, for offering me this opportunity. And of course, my uh, email is here. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, I got one more um, comment. Just a thank you. Oh, okay. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>